Welcome to Broadway Drumming 101. My guest today is the black belt of drumming. <laughs> <laughs> I brought that up because Mr. Damon Dwight is not only a badass drummer, but you don't want to mess with him, dude. He's a black belt. He's a great person, too. Welcome to the Broadway Drumming 101 podcast. And thank you for having me. And before we start, Clayton, I'd like to thank you because I can only imagine the amount of work that goes into doing this. And I thank you for this, and I thank you for having me. I really do. I appreciate that, and I'm glad we can catch up. It's been a long time since I've seen you in person and long time since we've like hung out and, and chatted, but right. we can talk music, we can talk uh, martial arts, but, and we're going to talk about drumming, but I think we're going to talk about musical theater here since that's the, uh, the focus of my podcast. But I want to just talk about you going back to when you were a little, little, little child. What was your first musical memory? Well, my first musical memory was my dad. Hmm. My dad played. Um, you know, he was he was like a weekend warrior. He worked the job, but he played he played gigs on the weekend, and the bands rehearsed at our house. Oh wow! Right. That was in New and, York City. No, 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 no. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I grew up in a suburb. I'm not even going to call it a suburb. It was more rural than anything outside of Philadelphia. I okay. grew up, it was about 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia and you would think you were in Kentucky. Like, <laughs> it was like, it was like that. It was a place called Chester, well, Twin Oaks, Pennsylvania, near Westchester, Pennsylvania. I don't know if you're familiar with that area. Okay. But anyway, very small town outside of uh, Philly. And, and that's where I grew up. And, and so my dad, he gigged in and around the Philadelphia area. And he was a bad dude. What did, what did, what did he play? <laughs> His thing was like swing. swing. He was, it was like jazz, small combo, jazz, you know, A-Train and, you know, all of that. Uh, and he played, you know, it was like an organ quartet, sometimes a quintet. Uh, that was the w one of the bands that he played in. And as a matter of fact, that 1964 Ludwig kit in the corner. That was his? That was the kit that I started on. Wow. <laughs> and you still have it. Do you, do you play on it? No, it does not leave the house. Oh, it really? Doesn't... No, I mean, that, that was, that's, it's, it's a collector's item. It was the Ringo, it was the, the kit that Ringo played that oh, wow. Day. And so back then everybody was was buying those kits. And you know, for my dad my me and my dad back then, that was a lot of money that he spent on that kit. You know? So, so you watched your father play, did he teach you lessons? No, it was it was weird. No, it was weird. I was very young. I was about five or six years old, and my dad, because of the money that he spent on that kid, he said to me, I better not see you play my drums. But when he wasn't there, my mother would let me play because her thing was, if I hear you, I don't have to watch you. Mm. She, she, and, you know, she was like a housewife. She knew where I was as long as she heard the drums. Why didn't your father want you to play? Because he spent a lot of money on that, that drum kit. He didn't, he didn't discourage you from playing drums as a profession, or did he? Well, this is, this is the, the, the rest of the story. The signal from my mother was, your father's coming, get off the drums. <laughs> and then one day, she didn't give me the signal, so I was playing, I was playing my, and I looked up and he was standing in the doorway. Okay. And Clayton, I got to say this, thank God that the seat had like a, it wasn't fabric. It was like that 
fake leather thing because I peed on myself when I <laughs> when I saw. <laughs> wow. So he he said to me, he said, I thought I told you, you know, not to mess with my drums, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> How long have you been doing this? I'm like, ah. Oh. So he yeah. said to me. And so I, he was standing there for a while. So he said, okay, do you want to play? So I said, yeah, I'd like to play. So he said, okay, if you want to play, you have to take lessons and you have to learn how to read. I didn't know what he meant by that. But what it was is there were a lot of gigs that he could not do because he couldn't read. Hey. So in, you know what I mean? So he wanted me to be able to do gigs that required reading. So in answer to your question, I never formally studied with him, but I got a lot of what he had. I got, you know, some of uh, some of the great qualities that he had in playing just from watching him. And then eventually, as I had gotten older, uh, you know, I picked up little tips, but then he had stopped playing, you know, after a while. You know what I mean? And he still didn't. Allow you to play that drum set? No, 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 no. Once, once that, once he saw how I played, uh. and I started, then I was allowed to play the drums. You know what I mean? He let me, he let me play the drums. And actually, my first gigs were with those drums. Hmm. He allowed me to take those drums out. You know. And who did you play with? Did you play with people in your neighborhood? People in <laughs> Philadelphia? Yeah. Yeah, it was just a local. A, my first gig uh, was with a, a you know a local band, and they were. Uh, it was like a doo wop band, you know, like they did the OJ's and all of that kind of stuff, you know, stuff like that. So we played in and around the Philadelphia area with with that with that band. Were there other drummers other than your father that you idolized or that you looked up to at the time? Well, at at that at that time. This was all new to me. This was all new, like being in a band. I mean, because from the time that I, I started taking lessons at like 10, 10 years old, and then I stopped because I started taking karate. Mm. And I hadn't played in a while. And then I got a call from these, this band. A friend of mine, a bass player, told these people to call me. And I was, I was like, I hadn't played in years. So I went, my dad actually took me to the audition and I went and I got the gig. So as far as other drummers in the area that I looked up to, I, I, up until that point, I wasn't even interested in playing music. But that, that band, once I had gotten into that band, you know, we backed up a singing group, but the guys in the band, I was like, man, what are these guys doing? Like before the singers would come, they were playing like, Return to Forever, Maha Vishnu Orchestra, stuff that I, like I said, I had no idea what it was. But all I know was that I had never seen anybody play that fast, play that many notes or this and that. And I'm like, man, what is this? What are they doing? And so they just sparked my interest. And then so through those guys, I just became more and more interested in music and wanting to get better. You know, so I was about, I think I was about 15 then, at that time, you know. What were you listening to as a 15-year-old teenager at the time? Were you listening to a lot of radio? Were you listening to a lot of people in your neighborhood? What was the musical world like at that time? Yeah, we had a, we had a great radio station. First, we had two great radio stations out of, out of Temple University. We had the jazz station WRTI. And then we had the... the the serious R&B station, uh, um, WDAS. You know what I mean? That was that, like and they had been around like since the 60s. Mm. You know, coming out of Philly. So I had that, but there was, you know, but there was always music in the house. Like my dad, he, although, even though at that time he had stopped playing, he st we had jazz playing and my mother, she had the gospel playing. And a year, few years prior to that, my, my brother had come home from Vietnam and he had, he had brought home all of this killing stereo equipment. He was into Sly and the Family, Stone, War, 
Chicago. You know, he had turned me on to all that music. So there was always music in the house. So I didn't, it was like, I didn't consciously listen to music. Like, I didn't wake up saying, okay, I'm going to listen to it. But it was just always there. Mm. And I was just absorbing it all the time, unconsciously. You know, just always absorbing the music. Um, and, and that's how, you know, I, I mean, and, and, and like I said, I didn't, and I still wasn't serious. I still, you know, like, I didn't know that that was what I wanted to do. Well, when did you figure out? that you wanted to go to school for music or you wanted to be a professional musician? Well, th that band that I was in, uh, after about a year, they, they brought in a sax player. And this guy, I was like, oh my God, he had just gotten off the road with Gil Scott Heron. Hmm. And I said, man, I said, man, where did you study? And he said, I studied at Berkeley, you know, Berkeley College of Music. And I, I went home that night <laughs> said to my parents, you know, I want to, I want to go to Berkeley. When I heard this guy, I was like, man, I want to, I want to go to Berkeley. And my parents were like, okay, all right, go, cool. you know? And that's, I think that was the, that was the point when I said, man, I, I want to do this. I really, really want to do this. So you went to Berkeley. Yeah. Usually, you know, I hear stories of when people go to Berkeley they stay for a year, two years, then they go, they leave and they go on tour. Did that happen to you or did you stay and get your degree in jazz? I, I, that was, I, I left. Okay. I I two years. But the time that I spent there, man, man I'm just going to say this. I don't think it's been a, it's been a while since they've had that heavily concentrated group of musicians. When I got there it was Terry Lynn Carrington, Cindy Blackman, Marvin Smitty Smith, Jeff Tane Watts, Billy Kilson, uh Tommy Camel, Tommy Campbell. Um that was just a few Damn. of the musicians that were there. Branford Marcellus Donald Harrison, Greg Osby, uh, Cyrus Chestnut, who went on to play with Wynton Marcellus, Rochelle Farrell, Kevin Eubanks. Wait, these were all people that were students at the time or they were faculty? They were students, <laughs> were former students. Like Kevin Eubanks, he, he had left school, but he stayed in Boston. Mm. The same as Tommy Campbell. So all of these people were there when I got there. In answer to your question, like everybody stayed for a while and then they left. But I, I got so much from that short period of time that I was there from them that it was, it was amazing. You left there to go on tour with Roberta Flack? No, no, no. I, I went on tour. It was like a... a it, it was this band. They did like lounges and casinos and stuff. And so we, you know, we went traveling and this and that. And then after that, that's when I, I moved to New York, like in 1982. So my first, my first gig in New York was Johnny Copeland, blues singer. Do you remember where you played? What, what venue it was? It was, it was, it was a, 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 a place called the Lone Star Cafe. That was one of the venues that we played here in New York, it was Lone Star Cat. Cause it was like a, you know, a pretty popular spot. And Johnny, you know, Johnny was, he was pretty well known, you know? And like I said, he, my first trip to Europe was with him, you know, the Bern, Internet, Bern International Jazz Festival or something like that. You know, that was my, my first gig. So when you came here, was your goal to, uh play in shows like Hello Dolly or was it more like <laughs> I want to play at the knitting factory <laughs> I'm just you know, well, you know you know you know play this is crazy because I I didn't I didn't want to tour or do any my goal I wanted to be a studio musician I want you know so I worked on my reading and worked on my timing because I wanted to be one of those guys where, okay, I'm gonna finish this session, and then I'm gonna go to the next session and and you know, go to the next session and maybe play a club at night 
or 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 this or that. So that was that was my initial goal. But you know, I tell people that I you know I was on the eight o'clock bus for New York, and the drum machine was on the seven o'clock bus. <laughs> 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 you know, when I once I got a lot of those studio gigs, it kind of yeah on away because you know because of automation and all you know and all that because of the drum machine thing. You know, so when you when you saw that you know drum machine was on the seven o'clock bus and you you arrive and the drum machine is taking up all the work, how did you view you know your potential career in New York City at the time? Well, it went from me wanting to be a, a, a session musician, to playing in clubs because the clubs were still around. It wasn't like the, the, the club scene had totally dried up. There were still some great, you know, Lush Life, uh, uh, Sweet Basils. And, and I, was in, I was into like the R&B, the blues thing. So there was a club called uh, um, Mondo Connie. I remember that. Right, right. Uh, Clubs like that. Um, uh, Manny's Car Wash. Manny's Car Wash. That was the club. Yeah. That was the other club that I played at with a Johnny. Lot. And then Uptown, it was a club called, uh, um, oh, my God. Mikael's? There you go. Yes. Mikael's and all of those clubs. So they were still here. So I was able to, to gig, you know, in the clubs. You know what I mean? And and the session thing, I just had to put that, you know, decide for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you were here in the early 80s. Yes. You know, I, I, I grew up in Connecticut and went to Howard in the mid 80s and viewed hip hop from afar. This has nothing to do with Broadway, by the way, but it kind of does because if you know Run DMC, if you know the Cold Crush Brothers, if you know rock him if you know krs1 and you know trap called quest then you will know hamilton <laughs> so right, put that right, out right. There. but anyway yeah, right. when i was growing up i would listen and i was so compelled you know captivated by rap music of of new york and from 1979 in my opinion to like 1994 new york was the epicenter of rap music mm -hmm. were you as 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 enthralled as i was with rap music, knowing that, you know, in the mid eighties, it was pretty much all drum machines. Were you into the music at all since you were here and you were involved in the New York City nightlife and culture or that wasn't your thing? No, and I'm, you know, it wasn't, and I'm gonna say it was unfortunate because I really, I, I tried to stay away from it because I'm, I'm coming from Berkeley. And like I said, I mentioned all of the people that were at Berkeley when I was there. So my thing was, now I want to, I want to, I'm trying to play jazz. I'm trying to venture off into that. And the reason why I say it's unfortunate that I didn't listen to the music, that music at the time, because when I started listening to it, I guess like when, like, like 10 years ago, I was like, oh my God, this is, the, especially, Hip hop music of the '90s because it fused the R and B, which was the music I, I I grew up on. But I just shied away from it, and I was like, I hate to say this, but I was like becoming like a jazz purist and really couldn't play jazz. But I had that that kind of like elitist mindset. I, you know, that's drum machine. And I'm you know I'm a musician and this and that. And 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 that's why I said it was so unfortunate, man. Because when I when I went back to listen to that music, I was like, man, this is killing. This is this is this is really really killing. So I I you know I wasn't really into it like that at the time. You wound up going on tour with Roberta Flack in the early eighties. Tell me about how you got connected to Roberta and what that situation was like. I don't remember. I really don't. <laughs> You know, but I but I do know this because of that, because of that gig, the people that I met, and you know that, so the people on these gigs, the people, the, the connections you make, I knew that was an amazing thing. But I, I'm serious. I honestly, I don't remember. Mm. I do not. Wow, that's that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wound up 
playing with a whole bunch of people during your your years here, you know, yeah. Alex Cunyon and Shamika Copeland and George. Yeah. Don't George Austin, yeah. Yeah, Vernon, yeah, yeah. Vernon Reed, he was, you know, I'm sure he was doing a lot of similar kind of gigs when before Living Color. Were you doing stuff before Living Color came out or was it it was it was kind of it was kind of after and and let me clarify this when I like on my bio it says Vernon Reed it was actually Vernon Reed and I were on a gig together somebody had hired <laughs> <laughs> you saw me. Vernon hey was, no. hey, hey bro. and he was like yeah whatever uh, <laughs> yeah who was it was that you know what I mean so it was, so that's why you know I put Ver, I played with Vernon Reed because I actually did okay. but it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> so in the 80s, you're you're working with various artists in New York City. Uh, the 90s come around. Uh, did you have any inkling of doing Broadway at all? Did you, like, what was your introduction to Broadway? Going back to Roberta, because of the gig with Roberta, I met Zane Mark. And you, you, I know you're familiar with that name. Yes, Zane has written and done things for so many Broadway shows, it's kind of hard to count. But he, uh, he asked me, did I want to go on the road and do Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk? So that was, that was my first, but that wasn't, that wasn't until 97. Um, and, in the 90s, early 90s, I was playing with Hugh Masekela. Oh, wow. I was doing him and Mary McCabe. And then apartheid ended, it, for, for people that aren't familiar with you, South African artist, but he was in a self-imposed exile because he, was, he left South Africa in the early 60s. He was being sponsored by Harry Belafonte, but anyway, he was so outspoken about apartheid, he could not go back home. I didn't know that, wow. Right, he could not go back home because they had threatened to kill him. Damn. So in 1990, Mandela is released and apartheid supposedly is abolished. He goes back home and I do my first tour ever. It's his first tour in 30 years, a homecoming tour with him. So then the Broadway thing came after that. It came after that with Zane asking me to go on the road and do Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk. So how'd you connect with Zane? Well, from- from oh, Roberta. R Roberta, Zane was like the associate conductor. He was, he, he was really the MD. They had an MD, but he was really the MD for Roberta. And Zane remembered me and when this came up, he asked me to do Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk. Did you ever get a chance to see the show on Broadway? Did you sub there at all? No, no, I just, you know, I went in to observe. You know, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to, to sub, but I went in to observe, you know, I sat in the pit and, and all of that, you know. So from what I understand from that show, I saw it, I think one time on Broadway, they, you know, there's a drummer in the pit, but there were also bucket drummers, correct? The bucket drummers, yes. Did yes. you do any of that or was it mostly no, just I was strictly I was strictly on the kit. Strictly on the kit. Because that was you know, they did period pieces, you know, they did decades, you know, music in different decades. And then at the end of it was like the hip hop thing and they brought out the buckets, but we were still in the pit. You know what I mean? Did you ever get a chance to play on the buckets or were you like, nah, you guys <laughs> you, you Dude, I tried it. I tried it and I was like, you know what? Y'all got it. <laughs> because you know because it i'm serious man there is an art yes to doing that oh my god and these guys and but the drag was with them these guys could also play on on the kit mm. yeah a, a lot of few of these guys could play the kit and i was like don't come anywhere near these drums because <laughs> <laughs> you will break the heads <laughs> right making me feel bad no i'm you know, me you know, so, so it was a pretty, I guess, long tour, a little bit over a year. Or Init initially, it was supposed to be a year, and then it got extended, and we did two years. And where'd you go? Just in the states, but everywhere. Mm. Because what happened was, you know, the first year, 
you know, you do, you know, the primary cities or, or whatever, you know, for lack of a better term. And, you know, you're a month in one city or six weeks and this and that. And then the second go round, the, you know, the second year that we went, the length of time that you were in these cities, it's, it's a little shorter. But then you're doing more theaters because some of the, you know, smaller venues or whatever, you know, you're, you start doing those. So well, how did you stay sane playing the same show, the same, pretty much the same way every single night for o- over a year? It, you, you know, it's a, it's a gig, you know, and, and I, you know, I got to go back to my dad, man. You know, he, he was my superhero. My dad dug ditches. You know what I mean? At, at one time, at one time, he ended up being like, you know, in a managerial position. But, you know, I'm like, if he could do that, I'm going to complain about coming here. <laughs> playing and drums. For, right. Thing that I love to do. Right, for like two hours. So that's, that's what would help me to keep my focus. And, and then the other thing, too, about being on the road, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I was younger then. I didn't mind it because it was kind of like once you get into a city, it's kind of relaxing. It's kind of chill because you're not moving around. And they, we had apartments. You know, you go to the theater, you do the gig, and then, you know, I'm a gym rat. So, you know, I get up in the morning, I work out, do whatever. It was, it was great. It was, it was really, you know, it was, it was fine for me, you know. So. You get back into New York. Do you wind up being part of the theater scene? Did you go out on another tour? Like, you're like, man, I kind of like this gig. Or did you get back into playing in clubs? I mean, I got, I got back, you know, eventually, you know, you get back into playing the clubs because you, if, because people forget about you because you're, you know, <laughs> out of sight, out of mind, you know, so eventually I got back into the club thing and this was, uh, man, it was like this. Um, did I, no, it wasn't. No, I'm wrong. Yes. So I got back into the club thing for a while after, you know, after, after a while. Yeah. The next show I think you did was It Ain't Nothing But The Blues. Nothing, ain't Nothing But The Blues. And we did, you know, little small regional theaters. And I got us. This is my claim to fame on that. I was working with Gregory Porter. Oh, wow. Yes. Before he became Gregory Porter. <laughs> <laughs> Great singer. Yes. 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 So it was that. And that lasted, I think, about a year. A year. And then after that, I got the call with Shamika Copeland. Tell me about your experience subbing for Buddy Williams at The Color Purple. <laughs> just, just saying that, subbing for Buddy Williams, just, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I, I got to say this. I mean, buddy, my, my, you know, you, like going back to when you asked me, when did I decide that I wanted to do this for a living? You, you know, back then, Clayton, we had albums and you could look on the albums and see who was playing. And it was crazy because the, the songs that I gravitated to, you know, of course, you're looking who's on it. And that name kept coming up, kept coming up. Buddy Williams, you know, it was like Buddy Williams, Harvey Mason, uh, Steve Gadd, you know, those cats. And so because of Roberta, because of what Buddy, Buddy had heard about me on the Roberta gig. And one of the things that Buddy had said he admired, I could play soft. He liked the fact that I could play, because he had seen me on a gig. So fast forward to what you were saying about subbing for buddy just that alone was was nerve-wracking because <laughs> i gotta go in i have to go in for buddy so color purple it was it was it was one of my i gotta say it was one of my more challenging gigs because i had to also play, play percussion oh yeah that's right the djembe right didn't it yes, wasn't it yeah, thing? The and, yes that's true for me that was one of the most challenging shows for me because of because of that, you know, and 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 switching and 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 all of that, you know, 
But um, you know, like like anything else, once you once you get it under your belt, you know, it's 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 fine. And it was a great show, you know. I mean, just the storyline and the, the 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 performances, you know, and and everybody, you know, just that show in and of itself was just an amazing show, you know, to be a part of. When you get involved in theater, you meet a lot of different musicians, yeah. and there are things that 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 stem from your maybe subbing experience or working with somebody like, like Zane Mark. And there was a show that he was involved with called Holler, If You Hear Me. I yeah. understand you were a part of the show before it went to Broadway. Is that how things went down? Yeah, Zane. Yeah, I mean, like, I think it was maybe two years before it had even gotten to Broadway. We started doing workshops. We started, we started doing the workshops. You know, the first workshop was to spark the interest of the show. And then a year later, the next workshop is to get in, invest. No, first year was to get investors. The next year was to find a theater. We had the investors. And so, yeah, it was, that was like a year and a half, whatever, process before the show had even gotten to Broadway, you know? Did you wind up doing the show as well? Yeah, but the, the thing was, like we were like once we finally got the the green light, we had rehearsed for like two months, and I think the rehearsals lasted longer than the show. <laughs> really? Yeah, the show it didn't it didn't didn't last that long. Ah, it, it, it I remember last. seeing it at it was at that theater on Forty Seventh Street. Ambassador. Yeah. 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 It didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't last that long, and. You know who I don't know. I'm not privy to the information that comes through those channels, but I don't know why it didn't last. But it didn't. You know? mm. It was a great experience because it was Carl. You know, like you said, like you said, the musicians. It was a great experience because of the cats that you, you know, you get to play with. And 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 going back to I think what we were saying prior to when you started recording, uh, the vibe of the pit. We just had so much fun it was just it, we had such a great time and um uh, it was funny because i it's there's this old adage and i don't know if it still holds true today but they were like you know if you're having fun in the pit if you like the musicians in the pit and you like the music the show's not going to last and that <laughs> was the, that, that was the case with this show we just we had a great time you know, we really had a great time in the pit, you know what I mean? So so how did you marry the fact that you're playing drums in a Broadway show to music that was made with the drum machine that got to New York at 7 a.m. and you got here at 8? Because you're playing well, well, Tupac music. I, we were playing, I was playing V drums, for one thing. And so we, you know, we, we went through the process of programming programming the kit to match as as closely as we could to match what was happening on on the records you know what i mean so that that's how that happened you know which v drums i which i hate to play <laughs> <laughs> learning a show tell people what you do and what works best in your opinion to sub, to sub for someone on a Broadway show? I go in first to, to observe and, um, you know, I ask for the audio. And I don't know if I can say this, but I, I get the conductor's video. Yeah, it's fine. Um, and, you know, I start, I start listening, listening to the music, looking at the conductor's video. And what I do is I, when, I, when I listen through I, I pinpoint for me what I consider the most difficult parts of the show. And in that, I mean like fast segues, you know, or, or, or tempo changes, or, you know, certain cues that I need to be aware of. And then once I, I go through those, and then I start, I start running the show looking at, uh, the conductor's video, and then also too, you know, verbal cues and 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 this and that, and I start, you know, writing down notes for all of these cues, 
And then once I, you know, once I start, once I get to the point where uh, I'm just practicing with the uh, conductor's video, then it's like, okay, I'm doing the show. Like I'm, you know, it's, 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 I'm at that point now where this is the fine, this is my final process for preparation is to start, start playing along with the conductor's video, you know. And another thing too, what I do is I go in and take a photo of the drummer's setup. And I set my drums up as closely as I can to how they have their drums set up. And I practice like that. Yeah, I find that to be very, very important because when you get behind someone else's drum set, you're not allowed to change the angles of the toms or the cymbals. You can probably change the height of the snare and maybe the angle, but yeah. you have to be wary of that as well because the angle has to be coordinated with the microphone that's on there. Right, right, R exactly, exactly. And then think about the chair height and how far it is from the bass drum and what kind of bass drum pedal somebody's using. Taking a picture of somebody's drum set and matching it to yours in a way that you can practice to it is very, very important. Yeah, and I, and, and you know, I, I mean, I almost make it a conscious effort to not be comfortable when I'm practicing because like you said, you're going in sitting at a kit that you cannot adjust. So, and, and that's what it is. So I need to start getting used to I, and I don't want to say not getting comfortable because in practicing, hopefully by the time I go in there, I'm comfortable because I've practiced like that with my kit set up as close to what they have as possible. You know. So Buddy said, you know, I like Damon for the color purple. I like Damon for Motown. So I said, I want you to come back to me again and suffer me at this funk, the funkiest show ever. <laughs> Hello, Dolly. <laughs> How do you go from holler if you hear me, bringing the noise, Motown, to Hello, Dolly? Tell me about, you know, I, I don't know anything really about Hello, Dolly. I've never seen the show. I don't know. Right. I know the, the song Hello, Dolly. Is it like, you know, you're driving down the street and you take a, a uh, the sharp right turn is it is it that different from anything you've ever done or were you you know prepared to do something like that i mean no no i mean i was prepared because first first of all it's it's a gig and you go in with the sole purpose of doing what's needed on the gig and for me it was great because it wasn't a challenging show the mu you know, there wasn't like we were playing difficult beats. Oonch, 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 oonch. You know, and I had bills to pay. But <laughs> <laughs> so, he calls, it's like, yes, yes. <laughs> right. I mean, it's no, it's a no brainer. I, you know, I'm like, okay. And 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 that's what that was one of the things Buddy said. He said the hardest part of, about this gig is staying awake. <laughs> <laughs> Really? I, it, so tell me about this, the music for that show. I mean, is it mostly Boom Chick or is it like big band stuff? Like what? It was No, it wasn't like big band stuff because, you know, because really the music was far less important for that show. To me, the music was far less important than any other show that I've done. And and and, you know, and also, too, in, in all of these shows, the music isn't the most important thing. It's always about what's happening on stage. So in this show, to me, the music was even far less important because it wasn't that it wasn't that crazy. It wasn't a whole lot of, you know, it wasn't out front. It wasn't like Tina. It wasn't like playing Tina. You you know, you're basically a support and you're basically just well, just supporting the dialogue, supporting what's going on on stage. So it was. It really wasn't a big deal, you know. It wasn't. You know what I mean. It wasn't. Wasn't hard at all, you know. wasn't difficult at all. So there was no stomping on the stage by Bette Midler saying, "What's going on downstairs? What's the, wh why isn't this right?" Or it, it wasn't a pressure-filled environment, knowing that she's upstairs. 
Sure. Well, you know what, but 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 Clayton, I got I got to tell you this though, uh, and 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 you know what, I want to say this because I want people to know that it's not all peaches and cream. When I first went in, I played for the main conductor, and it was funny. He was like, "There's something that I'm not doing," and it was driving him nuts. It was dri- It was driving him nuts. Couldn't figure out what it was, so he said. He says, like, I can't, I don't, I don't know what it is. He said, but bet is, bet is not going to like it. So he said in the beginning, you cannot play the show for bet, but I could play for right. her own study. Yeah. So then he brought in, are you familiar with Justin Hornbeck? I know the name. Conductor. Great guy. Amazing guy. Who's also a drummer, percussionist. Mm. He came in and knew immediately what was happening. There was a seg- a section of the of the music where I was supposed to be playing sixteenths. I was playing eighth notes, mm. and the the main conductor couldn't figure out what it was. And so once that was cleared up, then I was I I got the green light. I was I was good. You know what I mean. Wow. So bet so, so going back to what you were saying, no, bet didn't didn't stomp on the stage. <laughs> they kind of saved me from that. I was kind of saved from that. So, you know. Well, an interesting thing about subbing, the people on up on stage, they know what they want because they've heard it from the original drummer. And if yeah. you're, you know, it's it's you can't simulate exactly what the principal drummer does but there are certain things that, that they know that they like and if it's 16th notes on a snare or a hi-hat and and with your case you can play 16th notes on the bass drum at 180 beats per minute <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know they they definitely can tell when they don't hear it then something's wrong and that's probably what the uh situation was no and and of course and and you have to appreciate you have to appreciate that. I mean, they they know they know what they want. And our job as subs is to come in and give them what they want. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, try to try to come as close to that as possible as as you know as you can. I mean, that's that's the nature of the beast. You know, and I you can't be mad at them for for calling you out for not giving them what they want or not not saying calling you out or not addressing the fact that you're not giving them what they want you know what i mean and it's up to you or and them to work it out now like i said but, I mean, you know for for that situation the problem came when he wasn't sure exactly what it was that i wasn't giving him you know, and then he brought in Justin and Justin cleared it up. And so it was all, you know, it was fine after that. You know what I mean? It was, it was good, you know? So when I got here in 1993, I would go to a lot of different clubs. I'd see you play. I'd see Rocky Bryant play. I'd see Jojo Meyer play. I'd see Gene Lake play. I'd see Nathaniel Townsley play. Mm-hmm. Some of my favorite drummers in New York, I just mentioned, and they're all, except for Jojo, uh, he might be someplace else, but a lot of them are still around. But one, there's a guy that played on a song called New World New World Order. It was on an album by a group called The Family Stand in 1991. Mm-hmm. And this guy, Rocky Bryant, is killing on that song. Like, who the hell is this Rocky Bryant guy? It's like, God damn, is he good? Yes, yes. And I've seen him play a number of times, and you know, these are the people that I'm like, I was just telling Damon before we got on this uh, call that I've been looking at a lot of Dennis Chambers recently, and I I forgot how great he was. And I looked at his solo, I'm like, you know, those things where you watch somebody play and you're like, oh, my God, I'll never be as good as him. It's either inspiring or, you know, ego deflating. You know, when I heard Rocky play and I still see him play, you know, he's he's so such on a high level. I'm like, man. But then you realize, you know, he gets hired to be the drummer for a show called Tina. I'm like, holy cow, this guy's going to be right across the street from me where I was at Ain't Too Proud. And yeah. not only did Buddy call you, Rocky Bryant called you, 
to serve for him at Tina. Tell me how you connected, how that connection started. Was it from way back in the day and you guys just knew each other? And No, no just check this out. He didn't call me. No, no. You know what? I think the show had had only been open for about a month. And I was I was doing a gig. I was at, it, you know, as a matter of fact, it was the Black, uh, the Black Theater Festival in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I was down there with Vivian Reed. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Tony, Tony nominated uh, performer on Broadway, but, but the bass player, the bassist at the time was Kenny, Kenny Davis. I don't know if you're familiar with Kenny. So he said to me, he said, man, Rocky, I don't know if you know it, but Rocky is doing Tina Turner and he's looking for subs. So I said, okay. And I hadn't spoken to Rocky. Oh man, it must've been years. So I said, well, can you, can you call him for me? I don't want to, I didn't want to, you know, you haven't spoken to a person and all of a sudden, oh, hey man, I hear you doing Broadway can, you know. So I didn't, I didn't feel right you know, doing that. So Kenny called him and it was, it was so crazy. And I, so I, and I said to Kenny, you know, ask him, does he, he remember me? And so, so Rocky, he called me, he's like, really? Do I, re do I, re yes, I remember you. So, so that was it, you know, he, and, and so he asked me to come down and then that was, that was it. You know, I, you know, that's how I, I got that gig. So I hear at that show, when it was open, there were a lot of costume changes and you had to know certain choreography and tell me what, you know, was it, obviously you've subbed at shows before, you've had your own show for a minute. The biggest differences between subbing for like Hello Dolly or Motown or The Color Purple, as opposed to something where you're actually on stage and you're doing things. Tell me about that experience. If that was new. That was that was totally different because it you know timing you know timing is everything you have to run down at a certain time you have, and someone's there you know with your jacket and with your pants you know with your shoes and then you know you sit at the kit they roll the kit out you know they roll the kit back you come off stage you stand at a certain spot until someone moves. You hand this person the symbol, then you run over here. The person is there with your pants, your new change of clothes. It was it was a lot. It 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 was a lot. And then I had a little, you know, little small acting part, which <laughs> which was very small. When I You had to take Ike off of Tina, like what it was it was almost it was oh, almost man. Almost that. I with he threw he throws a symbol at Tina. Oh, damn. He grabs my symbol. I'm off stage. He grabs my symbol and throws it at her. And then I come on, everybody comes on stage, it's like, what's going on? And so then she picks up the symbol and I have to walk out and get it from her. And she's like apologetic, you know, about my symbol. And I have to give her a little nod, like, you know, it's 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 okay. And I grab the symbol and I I walk off. So what? Oh, but man, I, I was just joking, but damn. <laughs> Wait, so what's well, not a real symbol, is it? No, no, it, no, no, no. It's not not the symbol. And 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 this is the thing too. I'm playing. I'm playing the real kit back behind the scrim up on the platform. On stage, I'm playing V drums. Ah, uh, so, okay, okay. So they have the V drum symbol, but then they have this one symbol as a prop which is the symbol he uses to throw at Tina. So he actually throws it? He, he throws it. But it's like, you know, it's like one of those, what's one of the cheapest symbols, you know, yeah, that you get? Yeah, 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 yeah. He throws it, you know, it hits the ground, like, you know, how dare you or something, you know, whatever, you bitch. You know, I, you know, Ike. It was Ike, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. I wish I had seen that show, man. I heard it was really, really good. Oh, I mean, I, I have to say this. Of all the shows I've done, that was the one that was the most fun. As challenging as it was with the costume changes 
you know, once I had gotten that down and could really enjoy myself, that was one of the most fun shows that I had ever been on. Mm. You know, because we, you know, we got to play, it was like a concert. We got to play the tunes in their entirety. You know, unlike Motown, you know, like with Motown, you know, those are songs I grew up on, you know, just as you're getting to the good part. <laughs> yep, I know. So with Tina, it was like we we got to rock out. It was just, oh man, it was it was great. It was it was great. It was it was great. So I, you know, I really I really loved that show. That was that was my favorite. So someone moves to New York or somebody wants to move to New York and wants to play shows or become a successful musician like yourself, what's one thing that you'd recommend that they do? Network. You know, I mean, you got you got you have to get out there. You have to make yourself known. You know, you have to make yourself known. I mean, it was, it was a little different for me because, you know, I was I was fortunate because going back to my Berkeley days, man, the people that that group of people, those names that I mentioned, most of them moved to New York. So we all knew each other. So, you know, we are all calling each other. So it was a little it was a little different uh, for me. But for for and I, and, and you know, you know, Clayton, the, the scene has changed so much. I don't I don't want to give people advice from my coming here because I don't want to give them the wrong advice because I'm not really sure how the scene is like there aren't as many clubs as as there there were and there aren't as many clubs now as there were back then so I don't know how they go about making their connections but that's one of the things that I would suggest you try to make as many connections as possible you know um, I, I know on one of one of your podcast you had mentioned something about having a youtube channel you know and putting yourself out there through that you know what i mean so i think that's one of the ways of of making yourself known you know and 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 and, and getting your name out there if someone wants to become a black belt <laughs> What steps does one need to take? You know, I, I just, I'm kind of joking, but I, I admire your your commitment to physical fitness. What's your secret to uh, to maintaining a healthy weight and a healthy lifestyle? Just eating less. I started. I I I, I realized that I have to eat less. You know, and and I you know like when you, you remember when you sent me the question, some of the questions that you said you would ask. You know, mm -hmm. one of them was what what is one of the things that i i'm promoting now mm -hmm. what i'm promoting right now i'm trying to promote is a healthier way of life for for my friends and my loved ones you know what i mean that's 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 what i'm 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 doing and 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 the reason being is because i've re you know past few years i'm i'm you know, friends of mine and loved ones of mine are su succumbing to to illnesses and health issues that I know can easily be fixed with a minor change in your diet and a small amount of exercise and and a, and a, an annual checkup. You know what I mean? A lot of what they're going through can be be prevented just with those those few steps. You know what I mean? So, so for me, as far as maintaining, I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've been going to the gym for 40 years. I've been working out for 40 years, but the last, I think the last 10 years, I think I finally got it, got it right. Where, uh, uh, I'm he I'm healthier. I was, you know, I was younger, so I was eating. I I could eat anything and and maintain a, a, a certain weight, but I was eating garbage. You know, now I'm eating better and maintaining that same weight, and and I and I realize that I don't have to eat, I don't have to eat as much, you know, to to main to maintain this weight, you know, 
Um, so that's 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 my that's how I do it. I don't I just don't eat as much as I I thought I did. And if, then of course too, I'm working out. You know, I'm working out like an hour and a half a day for five you know five days a week or something like that. Sometimes two hours. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. It's, and and I, I tell people there's you know there's three levels of working out. The first level is just to improve your health, and that could be thirty minutes of walking. Mm. That's it. The next level is fitness. You want to be more fit, so you start you know doing muscle toning and this and that. And then the next level is performance. You're working out because you're at your training for an event you're training for a marathon or you're training for football or you're training for for sport that's the that's the very that's the highest level and it depends on your goal you know what you're what you're trying to accomplish yeah my my goal is to get back into my fly clothes man i'm sorry i have a closet full of great stuff that i used to be able to wear i'm like i'm getting back into it i'm de- i'm as determined to get back into those clothes as i was determined to be a successful musician in New York. And yeah. when, I, when, I'm, when I have that goal, I'm sorry, it, there's kind of no stopping me. I shouldn't say kind of. There is no stopping me. Yeah. And yeah. I, I also need to get back into the whole boxing thing because, man, that's that's incredible. That's incredible workout. Yes, man, it is. Hard. Yes, 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 it is. Yes, it is. But I, I, you know, like I tell people, just don't, don't, number one, don't set your goals too high. You know, I mean, I like you said, you want to get back into your clothes, but just start walking. You know, I'm going to walk every day, 30 minutes, seriously. And not, you know, not like, a, you know, like you're walking through the mall or you're walking with your, with your lady and you, you know, you're looking at, <laughs> looking at the windows. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Get out there and move. Just walk. Yeah, just that's it. You know? Yeah. That's just just start. Start there. You know what I mean? That's that's my thing. You know? If people want to reach out to you, do you teach things? Do you do you have a, a fitness program for people? And number one, do you also teach drum lessons? And number three, what are the ways for people to actually reach out to you? Uh, my, my email. Uh, that's the best way to to reach me through through email. Of course, you know, I mean, I have people reaching out to me through Facebook, but those are my Facebook friends. <laughs> those are really, you know, people I know. But I mean, I think the best way to reach me is, is through my email. And that's my name, Damon Dwight at yahoo.com. All oh, one word, you know. And I'm on Instagram, you know, I'm on, I'm on Instagram also, you know. Do you do fitness programs for people? Do you, I like, I do. I, 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 you know what, I, I, I just started, I kind of just, I've done that, and then I kind of gotten, I kind of gotten back into it. Um, there's a, a, a young lady, she, I don't know if people are familiar, or you're familiar with a bassist named Reggie Workman. Mm-hmm. He was Miles and all of that. Well, his daughter, who's a cello player, she, her name is Nyoka Workman. She started uh, an organization called 52 Arts Studio. And through her, uh, she she asked me that I want to start a fitness class, which was something I didn't I didn't think about before. Uh, so we we're kind of getting that, trying to get that started. But if anyone wants to reach out to me, they can reach me through my my email address. And do you teach drum lessons? I do, I do, I do. Have, I have students, you know, that I teach. Not a lot. I have, you know, I have maybe like seven or eight students. Okay. Do you do any kind of martial art competition? Now, have you ever done that? Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, not at all. I, you know, that black belt thing that you're talking about, I was 14 years old. When oh, I really? Wow. Yeah. But because of that, that sparked my interest in staying fit. That was the one sp- the first sport that I that I that I ever did. So that was kind of the thing that so I haven't man, I haven't done any of that kind of stuff in a in a while. I mean I box, I hit the bag and all that, but I play a lot of tennis now. I've been playing tennis for mm. for the last 20 years. So that's my thing. 
I I train to be able to play tennis in the in the, starting in the spring. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. I'm like, I'm that's like there's music and then there's tennis for me. You know that's my that's my thing. Fascinating! I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. So, you have a favorite tennis player out now? Well, now my my favorite tennis player, two of my favorite tennis players, just retired. That's Serena Williams and Roger Federer. Mm. Because when I came in, I started playing twenty years ago. They were the ones. So, mm. for the last twenty years, it was wonderful. I was able to follow them. And Roger and Serena since they retired and I was just weeping over that. I'm, I'm, I'm forcing myself to get, you know, to get familiar with the newer, with the newer crop of tennis players that are coming up, you know. That's one of the other things that I'm, I'm really obsessed about is playing, playing tennis. I'm, I'm like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I appreciate you being a part of the podcast and telling me your story and, and hearing some insights about playing for shows and and just life in general. Yes, and listen, I I'm telling you, I can't thank you enough. And like I said, I really, you know, I see how much work you put into uh, doing this. It. It's a lot. I know it's a lot, and I can tell because it's quality. You know what uh, I mean? Because it's, it's 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 qualitative. So thank you again, man, and I appreciate you having me. And good to see you. You were like my neighbor, my next door neighbor, who's a great guy and I've seen twice a year. <laughs> he's, he's the greatest guy in the world. <laughs> I, I know, it's so weird, man. I, I used to walk by the theater like, wow, man. People I know, Alvin was there, Winston was there. You yes, were there. yes. <laughs> and I'd see Winston come by, you know, we they cross paths from time to time. I worked with him a couple of times years ago, but it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Great guy, man, great player. Just cool. yeah, but listen, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we'll catch up, man. Definitely, ladies and gentlemen, right. Damon Duway. I'm gonna have like clapping after this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. And we'll we will talk soon. Okay. All right. Good, man. All right. Talk thanks to you. again. Thank you for watching the Broadway Drumming 101 YouTube channel. If you like this video. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that bell icon so that you'll be notified when a new video is released.